Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. <coughs> Got a couple of uh, quick announcements before we get going. On Wednesday night, um, we have a at 7:15. We're going to have our regular class, and then at uh, se uh, that's at 6:30, and then at 7:15, we're going to have a called business meeting. And that's to take care of two orders of business and two orders of business only. We're going to, at that meeting, ask the church to approve the officers for 2015 and then also ask the church to approve the budget for 2015. So uh, it should only take a couple of moments, but if you're available, uh, we really, really would like to have you here to, to help make the decisions for the uh, church. Also, in your bulletin, there is a, a piece of paper uh, a flyer that talks about the um, sanctity of human life Sunday which we celebrate or we observe today so if you have a moment read that probably during the message or something uh, but do take a couple of moments to read through that and um, this is really a, a major problem um, not having um, not having any regulation on our very little regulation on um, the the abortion problem and um, you know we're we're killing 1.8 I believe it is uh, million babies a year and, um, and and it is a tragedy and it's something that we really need to address so if you get a moment or when you get a moment read through that if you will let's stand together we have come into this house for a purpose and that is to worship God. Again, we just thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings, and we thank you, Lord, that we have a, a nice, warm church to come to and uh, to be able to gather together, as the song said, to be able to worship you, sing praises to your holy name. Father, with that in mind, we invite you into this worship service. We ask, Lord, that everything that is said and done here today will in some way glorify the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you'll touch each heart that's here. Help us, Lord, to, to make this a beginning of drawing closer to you than ever before. Thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This time I'll ask Dusty if she'll come. Good morning. The Song of Degrees for Solomon. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake, waketh but in vain. Lord, teach us to commune before all things in our lives. Help us to seek your will in all our dealings. It is vain for you to rise up early, to set up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Teach us, Lord, to trust you always, and not to be troubled by the circumstances of life. Lo, children are heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. 
see our children in that light as being a blessing from the Lord, but certainly they are. And, um, it's, uh, it's good to, to have so many young people coming and, uh, and you know, after all, that is the future of the church. And, um, we older folks are, are going to, uh, one by one, check out of here, but uh, uh, what will be left is the, the church of the future, and, and that's what our young people are, the church of the future. Rise up and praise Him.
congregation go ahead and be seated. I'll ask if our ushers will come forth this morning. You got somebody to help you there, Ken? <coughs> Lee, maybe you can help yeah. Brother Ken. My <laughs> brother Lee, would you ask our offer for prayer? Lord, again, we thank you we had this opportunity to come to your house, Father, hear your words, sing your song. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give and back something you give to us. And we pray that we would be good mm -hmm. stirs on this money, Father, be with those who give and can. Yeah. We pray to be with the point servant, your brother Jim, and I behind the cross this morning. Do the work we need to hear.
you're able to on this last chorus, if you'll stand with us. There is something about that name. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it lists, and you hear the sound thereof, but can't tell where it comes or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a master of Israel and know not these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak that what we know and testify that what we've seen, and you receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, my prayer this morning is, Lord, that You will touch each heart that's here today. Lord, help us to, to put aside all the worries and concerns and all the things that uh, interfere with us being able to come to You and worship You. I pray today, Lord, that You will help us to just open our spiritual ears and our spiritual eyes and see and hear the good things that Jesus has for us today. In His name we say this. Amen. Amen. Early in Jesus' ministry, He was able to move around the countryside freely. He didn't have to worry too much about being attacked or being bothered. The religious leaders had not yet vowed to put Him to death. After the miracle of changing water into wine, you remember that took place at Cana, the first miracle that Jesus did, Jesus made His way to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. It was during this visit that our Lord went to the courtyard of the temple and drove out the, the money changers and the um, livestock merchants. They had set up in the outer temple court and um, they were, and, and it was a, let me, let me explain this to you. Um, these things were necessary. They needed to have their uh, currency translated or turned into um, the money that, that uh, the priest required. And they also needed to buy livestock, sheep and goats and, and uh, um, fowl for their worship. But it wasn't to be done in the temple. It wasn't to be done in the courtyard of the temple. Those places are holy to God and they're not for doing business. And sometimes in the modern church, we, we get so caught up with doing things in the church and having activities that we kind of step over that line ourselves a little bit. So we need to be careful. The, and, and you've heard people say over the years, well, this is just a building. Well, yes, it is just a building, but it's much more than just a building. It's the, it's the uh, sanctifying of this building that makes it special. Amen. We we declare that this building belongs to the worship and the purposes of God. Therefore, when you come into this building, it's appropriate if you're a man to take your hat off. You don't need to wear a baseball cap. You can The young people sometimes do, but, but we make allowance for them. But we should enter into this sanctuary with the idea that, hey, I'm, I'm going to approach God. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to, to see who's dressed in something new or who's dressed in something old. I'm here to worship God. I'm not here to, to critique things. I'm here to worship God. And if we all have that attitude when we come in, then everything changes. The worship experience changes for you. If you come to church, and you've heard this before, but if you come to church seeking a blessing, you're going to get a blessing. Amen. If you come to church to be critical, you're not going to receive a blessing and you're going to find fault with everything. Amen. That's the way it works. So Jesus went into the outer court and He chased the money changers and the livestock merchants out. And He told them, this place is God's house and it's holy and it's not to be disrespected by turning it into a house of merchandise. While there at Jerusalem, Jesus also did many miracles and um, these miracles caught the eyes of at least one of the religious leaders and, and I believe many more. Um, but this leader, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, and if you attended Sunday school in your uh, youth, then you've heard the story about Nicodemus climbing up in a sycamore tree and um, trying to see Jesus. Well, actually, Nicodemus had a relationship with Jesus. Nicodemus saw Jesus on several occasions. One of these occasions, and this is the first one listed, is here in the book of John. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Now, why he came at night, we're not certain. It may have been because he didn't want the other Pharisees to know what he was doing, but it also may have been something much simpler, like trying to get access to Jesus. Because during the day, the multitudes were gathered around him, and trying to get through to him wouldn't have been easy. So at night, there's a little less crowd um, interference, and, and the crowds had dissipated somewhat and gone to their homes um, and again, we, we don't know for sure, but there's a good possibility that it's a combination of the two. So Nicodemus recognized that there's something different about Jesus, something special. But Nicodemus wasn't quite ready to take the next step. So he came to Jesus, 
And he wasn't ready yet to receive Jesus as his Savior and Lord. We believe that did take place later on. But in chapter 3, verse 2, he said this to Jesus. Rabbi, or teacher, we know, notice that, we know that you are a teacher come from God for or because no man can do the miracles that you do unless God's with him. Nicodemus knew there was something special about Jesus. He saw the miracles which Jesus had done, and, and uh, he was obviously impressed with them. And Nicodemus also knew that unless God gave power to perform the miracles, Jesus would be unable to do them. So there was at work in Nicodemus a struggle. He's being torn. He knew the Hebrew law. He knew that there, the law spoke of a coming Messiah, and there, this Messiah would do many miraculous things and wondrous works. Nicodemus, yet, Nicodemus, like other people, had some preconceived ideas of who the Messiah would be and how he would come. You see, Jesus wasn't what the religious leaders were looking for. Many of the people, not just religious leaders, but the people proper, were looking for a, a warrior prince to come and, and to crush Rome and to, to raise up this rebellion against Rome. And, and that would come, but it would be several decades down the road when the Maccabees rose to power. But for right now, the Jews were looking for this warrior prince, and that isn't who Jesus was. They were looking for a king who would break the oppression of Rome and allow the Jews to live in peace. This Jesus just didn't fit that profile. He traveled through the countryside with a, a group of misfits, including fishermen and tax collectors, and certainly he didn't look like the Messiah that Nicodemus had imagined. Yet there was something different about this Jesus. He performed miracles, yes, but there was much, much more to him than just performing these amazing acts of healing. Jesus was different. He drew people to him not because he looked and acted necessarily like the king or the Messiah in their eyes, but, be, but by the words that he spoke. That's what brought people to him. He didn't brag about himself. Quite the contrary. He said that, that I'm not the person you need to look to. It's God that you look to. I'm his messenger. Come here to draw you close to God. That's what Jesus' initial purpose was. To, to draw us close to God. And then later on in his ministry, of course, his, his next position was to become a sacrifice on our behalf. To die for us. So, Jesus came in, in a different mode than was expected. And he spoke about the power and authority of God. Jesus called himself the Son of God, but his message wasn't one of calling an army to follow him. Rather, it was a message calling for the people to turn from their sin and to follow his example. Nicodemus, apparently a spokesman for this group of leaders, said in verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you're from God because of these miracles that you do. And Jesus responded in, in verse 3, Truly I say to you, unless a man, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now this statement puzzled the Jewish leader. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? See, Nicodemus was talking about physical things. He wasn't talking about... He's, he's impressed by spiritual, or physical healings and, and he sees Jesus as this, this worker of, of miracles, but he doesn't take that next step. He doesn't see that Jesus is, is doing miracles, certainly in the physical realm, but he's pointing to the spiritual realm. That's what his purpose is. The Lord used the physical to point the way to the spiritual. Here in John 3.3, 3, Jesus used the word for born, genoa, G-E-N-N-A-O. And it means to regenerate or to be delivered. Jesus was speaking about the need that all men have to be spiritually brought to life. Nicodemus is trying to imagine a literal birth, a physical delivery. How can a man be born again when he's old? He asked. Verse 5, 
Truly I tell you, said the Lord, unless a man is born again, born of water, which is the natural birth, that's how you get here to begin with, and then be born of the Spirit, that is the supernatural birth, then he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, we should all have that down as, as one of our basic uh, personal goals, is to make sure that after we've been born physically, that now we are born spiritually. We're born into the kingdom right. of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, Jesus said, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So obviously, Nicodemus is pretty puzzled by now, but the Lord continued on, verse 7. Don't marvel, or marvel not, that I said to you, you must be born again. Don't get hung up on my words, Nicodemus. Verse 8, the wind blows where it will. And you hear it, but you can't tell where it starts or ends. You ever thought about that? I mean, when, when I'm getting hit by the wind, I'm thinking about it, it blowing in my face, but I give no consideration. It started someplace. It goes someplace. I don't know where or how, but I know that it starts someplace and goes someplace. Jesus said that everyone that is born of the Spirit is like this. Simply put, Nicodemus, it isn't important how it works. What's important for us is that it does work, and it works quite well. Being born again signifies a change. We once lived according to the flesh. We were born of the flesh. That is, we were motivated by physical things. Like being impressed by miracles. And being impressed by the things people say and the things people do. Then, we understand that these works point to a much deeper and much more important thing. And that is the things of the Spirit. Nicodemus was impressed by the things he had heard and seen Jesus do. Um, if you turn on the TV and, and you turn to any of the Christian programs, um, you can be impressed real easy. Um, I mean, they have some fantastic music musicians and um, they have some fantastic performers and, and eloquent speakers. And, um, and, and that's fine. That, nothing wrong with that. But you can get so impressed with the physical that you don't see beyond that and understand that this is about the spiritual. That's where we should be directing people into the spiritual. Nicodemus was impressed by the things that he heard and seen Jesus do. And that was his gauge, if you will, to determine that God, our Jesus, was from God. But the Lord explained that many of the miracles, all the many miracles, were simply a means to the end. That's where they, they took, they were supposed to take the, the, uh, the, the witness or the viewer someplace. They started in the physical, but they were intended to go to the spiritual. They were intended to show people the power of God, and as was the case with Nicodemus, they accomplished a dual purpose. To meet the immediate need, such as the healing of a crippled man from birth, but more importantly, they, the miracles, pointed out that God has power over all things. Not just the physical, but spiritual too. Verse 9, Nicodemus by this time is really confused. He doesn't know what's going on. Jesus answered in verses 10 through 16, Are you a leader, a teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? What we have seen, we've testified about. What we know of, we've testified about. But you don't believe, and if you don't believe the things that we tell you, how is it that you're going to believe if I tell you about heavenly things? If you can't get the simple things of the physical down, then you're not going to understand spiritual matters either. It's interesting that he was talking to one of the leaders, of the, the religious leaders of the community. And he's telling him, you don't know Jack. <laughs> you don't know anything. Now, before we start feeling sorry for old Nicodemus, I want to keep in mind that he, like the other Pharisees and teachers, had set himself up as an instructor and a teacher. And what did he set himself up as an instructor and a teacher of? The things of God. So if you're going to um, preach and teach God, what would be required? That you understand what you're preaching and teaching about, right? Jesus said, if you don't understand physical things, how are you going to understand spiritual things? 
Just like many folks today, the Jewish teachers emphasized the restrictions of the law, that is the physical, and they ignored the things of the spirit. Now again, later on, up in uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 50, Nicodemus had the encounter again with Jesus, and, and we believe that he, he received Christ at that time. But um, the Jewish leaders are teaching the physical part of the law, but they're ignoring the spiritual part, which is what the, what the physical part pointed to. Verse 12, Jesus said, If I've told you or taught you earthly things and you don't believe, how is it that you'll believe if I teach you of heavenly or spiritual things? Now you remember what the purpose of the law was in the first place. It was given as a moral guidebook to help the people live and interact socially. That was the first thing the law was intended for. And secondly, it was given to show or prove that no one can keep the whole law. Because you're going to mess up. And as Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, not one jot or tittle shall pass in any ways from the law. That means um, until everything's fulfilled. So that means not even a comma is going to be moved out of place. Not a dot. Nothing. That's how the law is. It's not to be tampered with. And I think about that every time I hear an, uh, a new law coming down the pike here, in, uh, pipe down here in the um, United States and how we've changed and perverted God's law so much. And, and we change it all the time um, to, be, to be politically and socially correct and, and we ignore what the, what the purpose of the law was in the first place. So what is it that Jesus said is all to be fulfilled? Jesus spoke of um, the law is going to not change until everything's fulfilled. Jesus said that the law preceded and was preceded by the coming of Messiah. The law, the commandments, are physical. They served a physical purpose. And that was to bring order to the Jewish society and then point the way to heavenly or spiritual things. Nicodemus like the other Jewish teachers, got stuck on the obedience and the adherence to the law. But they missed the main purpose of the law. See, they had the law down as being the end of all ends. That that's the completion. If you obey the law, you're okay. Jesus said, yes, obey the law, but take it a step further. Bring it now into the spiritual realm, which is where it's supposed to be. But they missed that point. And they, they, they missed what Jesus uh, brought with him. So verse 13, No man, Jesus said, has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, him who is in, which is in heaven. And, and I don't want us to miss this part of Jesus' statement. No one has the ability to come and go into heaven except Jesus, according to his words. He's not limited to the physical. We are right now limited to the physical, but Jesus is spiritual as much as physical, and he's able to come and go between the two realms, between the physical realm and the, and the spiritual realm. Verse 14, as Moses lifted up the spirit in the wilderness, and you remember that story, the people in Israel, surprise, surprise, were disobedient to God. So as punishment, God sent poisonous snakes in, in their midst. And when they uh, cried out and told God they were sorry, then God had, had a, uh, the, the um, image of a snake um, set up on a pole and had Moses raise it up. And whenever you look towards, if you got bit by a snake and you look towards the, the snake that was on the pole, um, then God would have mercy on you and heal you. So Jesus was lifted up when we sinned for a purpose. And that was to heal us to take away our sin. And that's what he said. Just like that, that uh, pole is lifted up, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, this statement prophesied the crucifixion of Christ. And here's where it's important for Nicodemus and for all people to understand the difference between the spirit and the flesh. Verse 15. That, or because Jesus died on the cross, whosoever, and we talked about whosoever in the past couple of uh, sermons, doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been or who you were doing it with. God has forgiveness in mind for you. He has the um, forgiveness waiting for you. All you have to do is accept it. So it's whosoever believes in Him. And that is if we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and then made Him the Lord. That person, notice this, shall not perish but have eternal life. 
doesn't say there that you have to obey all the laws. doesn't say that. It says, whosoever believes in Jesus Christ shall not perish, but have eternal life. Nicodemus understood that Jesus was a teacher come from or come in the power of God. Why did he understand that? Because of verse 2. No man can do miracles like this unless God's with him. Many people today understand that Jesus is a great teacher and a great healer. Uh, almost every religion out there uh, recognizes Jesus as a prophet, as a worker of miracles. But Jesus' purpose for leaving heaven was much more than just to come down here and heal a few people. I mean, if you think about it, if God really wanted to uh, heal a lot of people, what would He have to do? Not much. Just speak and they would be healed. So Jesus came down to fulfill a purpose. That purpose, once again, was to show people the way and then, and, and then show them who the way was. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. So Jesus... Um, healing, his touching people, and, and curing them. That was his second purpose for coming. That wasn't his primary purpose. His main purpose for leaving heaven was to be lifted up on Calvary. To be a sacrifice. That is, to take our place on the cross. Everyone, no matter who it is, every single one of us has broke the law. We've all violated the law. Amen. Me, you, everyone. We've all broke the law. But God in His great love, John 3.16, so loved the world. And it's interesting because we, we see the world as being this, um, this um, adversarial um, uh, commodity. It's, uh, it, it's us against the world. But God loves the world. God so loved the world that He sent Jesus Christ. So, God loves the world even though the world has rejected Him. Even though the world has turned its back on God, God still loves the world. And He gave His only begotten Son, His firstborn Son, so that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, that is, eternally, but will live forever with God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you get it now, Nicodemus? It's not a physical thing, although it involves the physical. It's a spiritual thing. Look at the big picture. See, that's one of the problems that many people have when it comes to accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and making Him the Lord of our lives. We don't look at the big picture. All we see is me and how it relates to me rather than how I relate to it. God has a purpose for you, but you need to come to the cross. And when you do, you can look at the big picture. God knows you, me, everyone, better than we know ourselves. Now that's kind of frightening if you stop to think about it. God knows me better than I know myself. And despite that, what's interesting in that is even though God knows me, He still gave Jesus to me that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. How is it with you this morning? Do you know the spiritual as well as the physical? Many people are brought up in church and can quote uh, scripture and uh, passage and verse. Um, they can they know all the all the important uh, church phrases, the way that we talk around the church. They know all that stuff, but they don't know the spiritual side of Jesus Christ, and that is the ticket to heaven. If you don't know the spiritual side, you're like Nicodemus was before he met Christ. You're, you're educated, you're knowledgeable in the things of the church, and, and that's all fine and good. It's important for us to know what we believe and why we believe it, but there's so much more. And that's what Jesus said. If you don't understand physical things, then you're not going to understand spiritual things. God sent Jesus Christ because He so loved this world and He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done, but whosoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have eternal life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, today, 
as we set aside this time to um, for the invitation, um, as we look back as as um, members of this world, Lord, and we see all the atrocities and all the sins and all the things that are going on around us today. And, and Father, we wonder, um, what are you waiting for? Why, Lord, do we, do we see all these things going on and, and seemingly going on unchallenged? And yet, Lord, we know that there's a spiritual side that must be fulfilled also. And everything will be done in your time according to your plan. Help us, Lord, as Christians to understand that and to see the big picture. And if we're here today and we don't know you as our Savior and Lord, then, then Father, I pray that today will be that day when, when we accept you as Savior and begin our process of making you the Lord, the King of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we lead you in a song invitation? Again, if you're here today and you've not accepted the Lord, my question to you is, what are you waiting for? Uh, every day that goes by is a day that puts you that much closer to standing before Him. And if you've not accepted Him as your Savior and Lord, this would be a good day to do that.
the, um, the call business meeting for Wednesday, so uh, if you can make it, please come and um, help us to make the decisions for the budget and then also for the officers. Brother Lauren, would you dismiss us this morning, please?